I still get to work with a lot of my wonderful colleagues. Uh, Ron may, may not be joining us this morning, but of course he was a great mentor and Barbara Lee as well. And of course, other longtime value partners like Mel Foote. And I'm pleased to be here with so many health and so many leaders in health and related areas. It's truly an honor to be here and to have been asked to moderate this session and to be a part of the 25th anniversary of Constituency for Africa and of a series honoring the great Ron Brown. I wonder often how much better a country we would be today. And I also wonder whether the discussions being held this week might not begin at a more advanced starting point were it not for his <coughs> untimely death, as he was doing the very work that we're about today. And I think we all know the answer to that. I'm gonna be brief because we have such an interesting group of panels and panelists with a wealth of knowledge and experience. I know they will generate lively discussion and greatly inform the agenda that this series will create and which the needs of Africa and our brothers and sisters in Africa demand. When I chaired the CBC Health Brain Trust, we shifted the focus from disease-centered to root causes that cut across all of the disparities, and then to the social, economic, and political determinants of our health. And I was very fortunate to be a part of the Congressional Black Caucus because collectively, on whatever committees we sat or whatever task forces we were involved in, we dealt with those determinants. And in everything that I've read in preparation for today, it is that very same shift that some countries have already taken and that is needed across the continent to improve the health and the length of, and quality of life for the African people. <coughs> All of the panel discussions over these four days and the recommendations that will be forthcoming address the health in the same holistic way, whether it is improving nutrition security, transforming human capacity and nurturing young leaders, stimulating trade and investment, or strengthening democracy and governance. All of these efforts are necessary to ensure good health in a sustainable way. And so I'm especially pleased to be a small part of developing a comprehensive health agenda based on infrastructure and primary prevention for our ancestral home. I think you have bios of all of the speakers and we have a lot of accomplishments. So I'm gonna do some abbreviated introductions of our opening panel. Our first speaker to bring welcoming remarks is Mr. Tarek Ben Youssef, Charge the Affairs Afri of the African Union Mission. Welcome. Good morning and a very warm welcome. Thank you, Honorable Donna Christian, our moderator and chair of this morning's session. Uh, dear brother, um, Mr. Melvin Foot, President and CEO of uh, Constituency of for Africa, the Honorable Barbara Lee, the Honorable Ronald Dallums, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, and uh, all the distinguished participants today. It's an honor and a privilege for me and my colleagues here at the mission to welcome such a distinguished audience. Gather today at Africa House to examine a critical issue to Africa's sustainable development, how to strengthen Africa's health infrastructure, a recommendation for the next administration for addressing Africa's health infrastructure challenges. Allow me to commend the Constituency for Africa for its important contribution to the enhancement of the U.S.-Africa strategic partnership during the last 25 years and pay a sincere tribute to our brother Mr. Melvin Foote and his team and all the members for their leadership and service. This is a timely forum. The African Union highly appreciates the valuable contribution that have been made by the United States, the U.S. administrations, the Congress, civil society, the private sector, and particularly the diaspora, to the economic growth and development of our continent, exhibited through various initiatives focused on trade, on health, on power, on security, among others. As you all know, Africa has made significant strides in social and economic development, but has the potential to achieve more, even more if it can overcome the large burden of disease, which continues to be a barrier to faster development. I want to focus, if you allow me this morning, on the, the policy framework and the strategic vision that the African Union has put in place on health, 
So, uh, concerned by Africa's increasing disease burden, uh, despite good plans, uh, strategies, and progress, the African Union developed the African Health Strategy for 2007 and 2015. The goal of the strategy was to enrich and complement member state strategy by adding values in terms of health system strengthening from the unique continental perspective. The African Union 2007-2015 has provided a strategic framework and direction to African efforts in creating better health for all and had recognized that Africa had previously established health goal in addition to the Millennium Development Goals. The recently adopted uh, African Union Health Strategy 2016-2030 uh, is similar to some extent to its predecessor in that it also seeks to provide strategic direction for to Africa effort in creating better performance health sector, recognize existing continental commitment and addresses key challenges to reduce the continent's burdens of disease while also drawing on lessons learned and existing opportunity. Towards a vision of an integrated and prosperous Africa, free of its heavy burden of disease, disability, and premature death, the goal of the African Health Strategy 2016-2030 is to ensure healthy lives and promote the well-being of, of all in Africa in the context of Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. Agenda 2063 is the transformational vision of the African continent, uh, which has been adopted in 2015. And it's a transformational vision. It's a socioeconomic vision, which is aligned, by the way, to the sustainable development goals. The goals of our agenda in the next 50 years converge with the sustainable development goals. And Africa has been the only region, the only continent, which has come to the United Nations last year with, uh, with a, a vision uh, for post-sustainable uh, uh, post develop, post-millennium development goals, and all these goals now today are embedded in, in, in Agenda 2063. So the African Health Agenda 2016-2030 will create a more comprehensive, actionable, and strong, yet flexible platform around which member states, the regional economic community, the multilateral agency, the bilateral development partners, civil society, and other partners in the diaspora and Africa can converge and align to improve coherence and synergy in improving health in Africa. And I want just to highlight some of the guiding principles of this strategy, which will, I think are at the heart of what we are doing today, that health is a human right that must be accessible to all. That health is a development input and a result requiring multi-sectoral responses. That health system should provide for the continuum of service from conception to old age. That health is a productive sector. Investing in health brings positive economic uh, returns. Equity is an important in accessing health services and addressing the determinant of health effectiveness and efficiency are key in maximizing benefits from the available resources. Evidence is the basis for sound public health policy and practice. Health systems should provide quality service to people-centered community. Respect for cultural diversity and gender equality is important to overcome access barriers to health. Prevention is the most cost-effective way to reduce the burden of disease. And uh, regarding the vision and mission and the goals of the strategy, I want just to uh, add that the vision of our health strategy for the next 15 years is of an integrated and inclusive and prosperous Africa from its heavy burden of disease, disability, and premature death. The strategic objective that have been set by our heads of state and adopted by uh, uh, the members of the African uh, Union, the 54 members, is that by 2030, to achieve a universal health coverage by fulfilling existing global and continental commitment, which strengthen health system and improve social determinant of health in Africa by implementing a number of priority areas. 
and one of the other strategic ob objective is to reduce morbidity and preventable mortality from communicable and non-communicable diseases and other health conditions in Africa by implementing a number also of uh, priorities that are embedded in the strategy. Distinguished guests, as health financing is a shared responsibility requiring global active solidarity and collective efforts, development partners, in our view, should increase and align their financial and technical assistance with national health priorities and regional and continental uh, development scheme. So I think my message today is that we have to reinforce the, the bilateral cooperation, the regional perspective and the continental uh, frameworks. Since we have these framework and it's important to ensure through the advocacy that you play, ensure a more predictable and sustainable support to all these tracks, which they reinforce each other and which are, in fact, become critically important. Challenges cannot be addressed at the national level only. The regional economic communities, continental intergovernmental organizations like the African Union have become an increasingly important actor in addressing these challenges as demonstrated in the Ebola crisis epidemic. So I think Constituency for Africa has an important role in perspective of the new administration to highlight the importance of boosting, reinforcing our regional and continental cooperation with Africa, in addition to what we do at the bilateral levels. And here, uh, the Congress has a key role, as it has been demonstrated in AGOA, but also in other initiatives, whether in health or food security. So uh, I, I, my appeal is that we, we need to reinforce and strengthen that message and take it to another level, so as our uh, vision for the Africa in the next 50 years is aligned to what we are doing at the national level, at the regional level, and where our development partners, where civil society and the diaspora have a key role to play in this regard. So these are my simple remarks that I want to share with you, and thank you for your leadership and for your support to, to the continent. You are an important lever of influence. The, the, the comparative advantage that each one of you has today in advocating and advancing our common interest and national security objective and health is a critical national security issue. I think with your uh, sustained effort and leadership, we can achieve a lot. We have achieved a lot uh, during uh, the Obama administration and we have to commend President Obama leadership for taking the US-Africa relationship to the next level. I think his initiatives are commendable. The, uh, just to mention the upcoming US-Africa Business Forum that will be held for the second time in New York on the 21st and the AGOA Forum, I think there is a lot that has been accomplished. We need to build on what has been done and reinforce and diversify and deepen the strategic partnership between Africa, which, as I said, is at the national level, at the regional, at, at the continental level. And thank you, Madam Chair, and all the... Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Ben Yusuf, for your welcome. Thank you for hosting us this morning and for getting us started with an overview of the health strategy, the African Union health strategy. I think it starts to give us a framework. Our next speaker bringing greetings is Dr. Roscoe Moore, who's the interim chairman of the board of CFA and former Assistant U U United States Surgeon General and Rear Admiral in the United States Public Health Service. Until his retirement, Dr. Roscoe Moore served with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and was responsible in the last 12 years of his career as the principal person for global development support within the office of the secretary at HHS, with primary emphasis on continental Africa and other less developed countries of the world. He was principal liaison person between HHS and ministries of health in Africa with regard to the development of infrastructure and technical support for the delivery of preventive and curative health needs for the continent. So I know that you have a lot to share with us, Dr. Moore. Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. 
as was mentioned, I'm the interim chair of um, Constituents for Africa, and there's a particular reason for that, because that's what I wanted to be, interim chair, right? Interim chair, see? Mel Foote, yeah. By my guiding light, yeah. Yeah, I came upon a scene in Africa. I never had worked in Africa before I became, quote unquote, head of Africa with Health and Human Services. I had worked in the former Yugoslavia, um, um, Croatia, and Serbia, and uh, Poland. And I did stints with, uh, with Mexico. Um, when I was drafted, people to do this work, people were not um, uh, endearing to me because they said, well, you're not an Africanist, you know, so what do you bring to the table? Well, the first delegation that we took to Africa was Senegal. Um, and everyone on the delegation uh, with me were Africanists. And all of them got sick because they didn't follow the tenets of working in Mexico, you see? Uh, uh, so, so, so health and health and human conditions, even if you're highly educated, you can miss the boat, is what I was trying to get to. I was, um, I served under three presidents, um, uh, Bush 41, 41st president, his son Bush 43, <coughs> and the Clinton years. And everybody kind of thought I was political. No, I was rank and file, a grunt, and doing what I was told to do. And uh, I, quite frankly, I tried to get out of it, but there's no way to get out of it, that's for sure, because uh, I was in the Commission Corps. And they said, that's what you're going to do. And I took my, my limited talents, and we established within two years of my coming 40 health programs in 40 African countries, which became later, a, a subset of that was the 12 countries first chosen to be the, the president's um, emergency plan on, on AIDS. And that's how they got, got started. Uh, we had USAID funding, and essentially we were providing US Public Health Service expertise with USAID funding, because HHS at that time had no money for Africa. Although we did run uh, two malaria labs on the continent, one in Bamako, Mali, run by NIH, and one in Kasumu, uh, which is the ancestral home of, of, uh, of President Obama, um, run by CDC. Part of my job was for, for Congress was to explain every time we had a new Congress why the U.S. Ha has two malaria labs in the country of Africa. And I had to go down on the hill and explain to them that Africa was a continent. There were, there were two different countries, uh, and there you go. But that, it was like, like I could give the same lecture every other year um, to, to Congress. So, so people not knowing about Africa is nothing that's, 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 um, that's new. And thanks to Mel Foote and others, um, uh, this is coming to the, to the fore about what's going on in Africa, uh, that, that there are different countries, there are different people, there are different health challenges. Uh, CFA, under uh, Mel's leadership, we actually got, with other people, we got President Obama to step in during the Ebola uh, outbreak. The Cubans were already there, the Chinese were there. We were not there. When the United States showed up, uh, what the United States generally does is they take all the equipment back from the theater, back to the United States or back somewhere, and we petitioned the United States again to leave the equipment in those areas so there'd be some infrastructure. So uh, we're here, to, here today to continue talking about infrastructure, uh, health systems, and those things. And if you have a health system, health infrastructure, it, it really doesn't matter whether it's Ebola, it's, uh, it, it's, it's swine flu, it's whatever, because we have infrastructure. Most people treat hospitals and whatever as like a big emergency room. But you need infrastructure, you need people who are trained certain ways, um, and uh, I think the Dr. Uh, Herman will talk about that later, so I won't get into that, but in the training aspects. Uh, but just because someone is a healthcare professional does not necessarily mean that they know exactly what they're doing. And we go to the, it, the issues of the Goma camps during the Rwandan genocide. We uh, flew 13 of our nurses, nurse practitioners, to the Goma camp 
to take care of the unaccompanied children. Uh, when people, physicians on the ground, found out that they had nurses coming in, they thought they were there to help them out. No. They were there to set up public health programs to take care of the unaccompanied children. Further, in the Goma camps, it was on volcanic rock. So the sanitary conditions were, were awful there. The public health service provided public health service sanitarians okay, with, with big moving equipment to build the trains. No one had, 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 had mastered how you build the trains uh, in, a, in a refugee camp. But if, public health service, from my experience with the Native American areas in the U.S., would rock. We built trains there, too, so we could do it in Goma. So it's transferable information. So with that, I'm gonna, gonna stop, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. I trust that all of you are happy to be here. Uh, and it's great talking to you, and we'll, uh, hopefully I get the chance to talk to you uh, more uh, at a later, later point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for sharing some of your experience with us and uh, reminding us that sometimes you just have to think out of the box and even use other experiences uh, sometimes things are not that different here in our country is, uh, as we think, um, and some of what we learn here can be shared in Africa and around the world. Our, our next speaker is Harriet Shangarai. Ms. Shangarai is the Vice Chair of the Montgomery County, Maryland Committee on African Affairs and Case Manager Senior Nurse at the African American Health Program. She also serves as a coordinating member of the Constituency for Africa, African Healthcare Infrastructure Committee, focusing on maximizing diaspora participation and engaging and responding to the healthcare crisis in the continent. So welcome, uh, Ms. Shangarai, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. I'm very humbled to be here today, and I would like to observe all the protocols, and thank you all for coming. I would like to begin with a short introduction of what the African Healthcare Infrastructure Committee stands for. And um, in short, it is a subcommittee under the Constituents for Africa, which emerged in response to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. So it was 2010. 15, when it was decided by members of the CFA and uh, collab in collaboration with the African Union to convene a meeting here where we brainstormed of strategies that we can have in place in order to respond to issues of the healthcare crisis at home. And we realized that we cannot only wait until there is a major crisis. We have to be proactive. This has to be an ongoing effort. As we Look at the Ebola crisis, the epidemic itself. We realize that it exposed large fundamental health care insufficiencies on the continent. And if I repeat, we are talking about lack of qualified health care workers, poor health infrastructures, lack of awareness, deficiency in logistics, poor beliefs, which was very difficult if you remember some of the Healthcare workers were attacked during the Ebola epidemic because of lack of knowledge, awareness, and have that trust that they are here to save us. So we decided in order to minimize duplication of effort, we have to know who is where doing what. And we look right here in the room and say, what do we have at hand? And at this moment, I'm speaking via diaspora lens, where you see knowledge. Diaspora highly educated. You see skills, you see experience. We realize that despite all, we're working with international communities. But then diaspora has to be the engine behind solving our problems. So last year, no, early this year in April, Melvin and I went to Harvard for a global, cat global health catalyst to find out uh, what we can participate, who we can partner with in this mission. Right there, we found 
a doctor from Germany representing a group of 100 doctors located in German from diaspora, and that's Cameroon, and he's right here, Dr. Ngasa. So, <laughs> thank you for coming. So we realize that there are efforts there, activities are there within the diaspora, and this is a resource that we can tap into in order to maximize a greater impact. Again, we say, what else is in our hands? Adaptation and usage of information communication technologies was already in place. You have members of diaspora teaching in their own mother language. Dr. Angas himself with a television program translating health information to their language, having blogs already speaking the language of the people, which is a great tool for community health awareness. So I look into my own blog with my background of nursing with a passion for community health. The blog that I started not more than two years ago with over 30,000 viewers directly. So I chose to create awareness about uh, cervical cancer. Within an hour of posting the article, it was a woman from Iringa, that's somewhere in a um, rural area in Tanzania. She contacted me and said, now that I'm aware, and I'm 45 years old, I've never had a pap smear test, never knew about it. Where can I find the resources? That was the question. And I'm sitting in DC, never been to Iringa before, and trying to figure out, wow, what a gap. I thought maybe government has a website where the resources are listed, you just click, but that was not the case. So to maximize the impact of telecom uh, information communication tools, I pasted the question right there on the blog, asking if anyone is aware of resources that women can use to get variable tests, please list them here. It was within two hours we had the location and time of operation. So right there we see that we can incorporate information communication tools to make sure that we're maximizing health education. Because some of these conditions, such as cancer, is something that can be treatable, but only in timely. And also, I looked in the National Institute of Health, right on the front page, it's written, information and communication technologies has become an indispensable part of global health today. It is estimated that over 90% of countries, people do, do have access to cell phones. A lot of groups that I see in diaspora, they text one another for any kind of information. So we maximize that. We translate health information, package it in a small way that somebody can just read or have a video, start WhatsApping the group. Before you know, the information is there and people are accessing it. And once you communicate, you send the information, people are accessing it, you're sensitizing the community. So when resources come in, people are more willing to access the care. Another aspect of things that we look at was more the political and policy framework of the healthcare system in these countries. We found that, that budget lo allocated and health Care financing from domestic resources 2015, 2013 ranged between 0.2% to 15%, and that reflects the total government expenditure to the public health. We know that is not enough, and it cannot be enough. Most of them depend on basically donor funded programs or individual if they can afford it. As we look into it, as the president of CFA said, uh, we cannot continue to agonize. We have started to organize. And that's why we are here. We are willing to work with each and everybody to collaborate, to partner for a greater impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shangarai. We really um, are see a, a way forward just from listening to your remarks this morning. 
So um, my colleague and my mentor is not going to be here with us this morning. That's Ron Dellums. Um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, another partner in crime, will probably join us during the day, but she cannot be here at, at this particular time. So we're going to have remarks from our president and CEO, Dr. <laughs> Mr. Melvin Foote. Um, I cannot imagine that there's anyone in this room that doesn't know of Mr. Foote and his 35 plus years of experience and working in over 30 African countries and having founded the constituency of Africa and all of the good work that has been done over these 25 years and he's continuing to do so. We'll just welcome you, Mel, to bring your greetings. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, first, let me say I was the first person to visit the Africa Union mission here in Washington. The very first. I have a picture to prove it. I was the first. I want to establish that because Washington, we have a way of changing the facts on you in a hurry, you know. And next thing you know, everybody else claiming that distinction. But Tariq, he knows. He knows I was the first. <clears throat> but it's always great to be here uh, at the Africa Union mission, and thank you very much for hosting us. Um, let me say I'm, I'm happy this week. I really am, you know. Uh, I'm happy with the, the see you all here. I'm happy with the panel. I'm happy with Harriet. I thought that your presentation was excellent, it you know. Sure and, uh, you know, you really did represent the AHIC very well. So thank you very much. I'm happy for Roscoe Moore. Uh, Roscoe has been my interim chairman for about <laughs> five years. <laughs> I ain't never heard of that. And he has a philosophical, he's from Tuskegee, so he has a technical explanation for the title. You know, we said, take that title interim off, but he got the technical way, so I accept. Um, let me say that, uh, you know, this week, uh, you know, our theme is the setting the U.S. Africa agenda for the next administration. I don't know who's going to win the presidential election in 53 days, 54 days. I don't know. I have my own horse in the race, but we don't know. And uh, my experience has been in Washington is uh, don't be choosing sides. Don't, don't commit yourself unless you have to commit yourself, you know. Uh, we're going to work with whoever's in the White House, that's for sure, you know. Uh, that's CFA's mantra, you know. And I tell you, I work with all kinds since I've been in Washington, and I've been surprised. Uh, George W. Bush, you know, who would have thought? You know, this is the guy who got us in two wars. He created, crashed the, the, the housing market. The, bank, the banks crashed. I mean, the guy did everything wrong except Africa, you know, <laughs> except Africa. Fifteen billion for PEPFAR, you know, um, five billion for the Millennium Challenge account, uh, Colin Powell, Secretary of State, Jendai Frazier, Assistant Secretary for Africa, Linda Thomas, Greenfielder, Deputy, you know, who would have thought? But if you totally, um, if you totally pick a horse and say, I'm over here and I'm not going to work with over there, uh, I'm not sure that that works. So CFA's posture is we talk to whoever in, um, in, the, in the White House, you know. Um, now, um, so we're busy uh, collecting thoughts and ideals about, uh, you know, what we want to recommend to the next administration. Believe it or not, CFA has had a little small organization, but it would never have been a PEPFAR if it wasn't an AIDS Marshall Plan and Ron Dellums. It never would have been a PEPFAR, you know. And uh, we were all shocked when he stood up at the podium at the State of the Union and said 15 billion for HIV AIDS. We were shocked because we were just pushing the guy, pushing the guy, giving him all kinds of signals. And we got Barbara Lee to do the Leech Lee bill, you know. And uh, next thing you know, Bush stands up there. I'm going to give 15 billion dollars to Africa. What is that? Af Af Africa. Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't mad at him, you know. Uh, let me say also, uh, so we're busy, you know, President Obama, the Young African Leaders Initiative, YALI, you know, credit goes right here. I gave that idea to the president. And uh, I'm, 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 I think that the future of Africa will be impacted by YALI more than anything else that we've done, you know. Give it 10 years. Let's see where Africa is as a result of YALI. And so uh, CFA has a small organization, but we've had a big, big, big impact because we focus on the ideals we focus on the network. We focus on building the coalition among us, the cooperation mechanism. We build pan-African spirit. Marcus Gavi is proud of us. Let me say, uh, uh, so, so we, we're gathering ideals to present. Uh, on Thursday, we're having a policy conference uh, for about 30 people, you know? 
Not a big conference, a small conference, but the president of Namibia, Hagi Gango, was going to be sitting there, uh, as Linda Thomas Greenfield, Assistant Secretary for Africa, as is Congressman Karen Bass, as is Ambassador Andrew Young, as is Roscoe Moore, and a whole host of other, uh, really, we think the key thinkers about Africa who are going to be debating these recommendations that we're hearing and we'll be making a solid uh, recommendation. We only can recommend two or three things to this next administration. If you recommend 10 things, you get nothing, you know? You know, but if you could come up with two good ideas. Now, one of them is going to be the Centers for Disease Control in Africa. Now, whether we focus it at the regional levels or, or at, the, at the AU level itself is to be debated. But one of those is going to, one of those two going to be, I'm telling you guys, one of them is going to be the Centers for Disease Control. You know, um, Ebola, uh, we had our Ebola conference here at the height of the Ebola crisis. And I'm sad to say that the Ebola community has gone home, you know. The, the large number of deaths and dying that we've seen have gone home. It's over. We're back to business as usual. They're, they're doing the so called dances in the nightclubs and everybody happy, you know. And those of us who follow Africa Health and everybody in this room can tell you that, you know, it's going to come back. You know, this is not gone, you know. And if we don't do something to sustain uh, and, and, and support um, final, uh, you know, final resolutions, we know the next crisis is only a route around the corner, you know. So it's not time to go home. It's time to get organized. Um, let me say also my U.S. Congress here. You know, the, the member, uh, uh, Donna Christensen's former esteemed body, you know. They decided because they're short of money to fight Zika. Now the new, new scourge is Zika. Where are they taking the Zika? Where are they getting the Zika money from? Ebola money, you know. We got Ebola commitment for five years because we got to do all kinds of research and all kinds of things need to happen to stamp Ebola out. So, oh, there's some money over there fighting Ebola. Let's take that money and fight Zika with it. Hey, how about that? You know, uh, you know no, no, no comment, no cry, you know. And so, you know, I'm seeing Robin Peter to pay Paul. That ain't the solution to healthcare uh, infrastructure in Africa. Uh, so we got to do something about that. Uh, Congress must be educated about these issues. Um, the Africa leadership must be engaged. You know, it's not about the United States by itself. We got to lean on Tariq and his colleagues at the Africa Union to do their part. You know, you know, we want leadership. We want organizational skills. We want financial resources. We want technical assistance. Uh, we want the Africa Union to play the rightful role. You know, as it should be. But we want also the African governments to be engaged. Uh, this is about helping African people. You know, and every African government has got to help African people. You know. That is the reason why you got the government, you know. Uh, so we got to get the private sector involved. A lot of the private sector think that their job is to go and steal Africa's resources. You know, they think their job is to go get the cotan, go get the diamonds, get, go get the gold. You know, uh, my job is to go and take the resources out of Africa. What kind of job is that? And the people are not benefiting. So we got to talk about the social corporate responsibility and what role the private sector can play in, 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 in sustaining health care gains on the company. Now, we also got to deal with the next generation leadership. If we try to do this only with the old folks, we ain't getting nowhere. And so we got to make sure that the next generation is fully engaged, the next generation is fully educated, fully empowered to be part of this, help, this discussion about the future of Africa and the future of African people. So having said that, though I want to conclude my remarks, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I yield back the balance of my time. Actually, when um, Dr. Moore discussed um, equipment uh, being taken out of the country once it had been used there, um, uh, I'm a retiree from Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and when Walter Reed was closing, we had a project that was um, dedicated to getting excess medical equipment transferred from Walter Reed to uh, actually Liberia. Um, and and the, the project took us about three or four years. Ultimately, it did not work, but the, the concept was actually a good concept. We ended up giving uh, equipment to, Liber uh, to Ghana and, and, and some to uh, Liberia at uh, Tapita Hospital. So um, that equipment is always left unused and stored in a warehouse in um, Atlanta, Georgia, and in Italy. Much of that equipment, especially the equipment that was from Walter Reed, was state-of-the-art equipment, and uh, was, it's just now lying there. 
not being used. So a program that um, could be used to transfer uh, usable equipment uh, can be done if we uh, work with within the framework of our government and the governments uh, of the countries where we want to exchange. And of course, they have criteria to uh, not only maintain and keep the, you know, have sustainable uh, um, uh, ways of uh, maintaining the equipment, because that's also an, another pro pro problem. That's, that's the one. And, um, what was your name, ma'am? My name is Luana Kendoli. Uh, my name is I'm a uh, consultant for Biopharma. Um, I've worked with Gilead, but I, um, I am uh, uh, doing a lot of work right now in, in Africa to facilitate access to treatment at affordable cost. Uh, but also, I, I just wanted to, uh, to follow up on the issue of uh, equipment. There are infrastructures now being built in Africa. In, in particular, there is one big laboratory that is being built. Uh, in Senegal for research and uh, for research for training uh, and it's going to affect really uh, not only just Senegal yes. but the whole region uh, and one of the issues that came up with is the issue of uh, acquiring equipment yes and so I would yes, really like to yes, connect with you yes, to see what can be obtained from this uh, warehouse of equipment that's yeah. just sitting there right. because it can be put to good use right. yeah. okay. Just a quick, you mentioned two things that you are going to push through for the next administration, and the Africa CDC was one, and I think I forgot, I, I don't think I captured the second one. If you could just reiterate what your second uh, major uh, agenda push was again. You talked of Africa CDC as one of the priorities for, uh, you'll be putting forward, but the second piece, I just, I didn't capture that. All right, well, you know, and really, I'm only one person in the room. The bottom line is we're going to come to an agreement, you know. But I'm very influential. You know, some of us say like we like lobby, you know. And, and so I apologize for that. But, you know, I got to do what I do, right? But uh, I would say the second one for me is the next generation leadership. Uh, Yali uh, is, is, is actually seminal. You know, I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer. That's how I got involved in Africa via the Peace Corps. Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia, Eritrea. And I always thought Peace Corps was just, you know, great here, Americans going to Africa, and it served me well, and I served Africa well. But Peace Corps can't hold a, a candle to Yali, you know, where this summer we had a thousand young people representing all sectors, you know, everything from political to academic to healthcare to trade, business and trade, and uh, boy, became, a, not only did they learn a lot from stakeholders here in the United States, they learned a lot from each other, you know. So the Cameroonian met the Ethiopian, you know, and the Zimbabwean met the Malian, you know. And now they're Googling and, you know, what young people do, you know. Uh, they're totally uh, now linked up. And they already were brilliant because the U.S. embassies in each country identified them, not the governments, you know. Uh, President G Gangob and I had a conversation uh, here. He was in Washington three, three months ago, and we had a conversation at dinner, and he said, uh, why are the U.S. government picking the, the next leaders? Why are the United States? That? That's just insulting. I said, you know, if you ask Mugabe, send us your three. You know, who are you going to send? You know? And um, so I thought that that was the appropriate role for the U.S. government. I think the next, uh, the, the, the problem with Yali, quite frankly, you know, once, we, you, once you make something happen, all you can do is provide the seed. You can't implement. You know, they put you so far away and... You know, there's some other issues that go way back to ancient stuff here in the United States. But I would say that uh, the flaw in Yali is the fact that they didn't want them to meet African Americans of same ilk. They didn't want them to meet the young African Americans who are going to Harvard and Spelman and, you know, moving around here who are doing tremendous things. We know them. You know, we read them in the magazine. And so it's almost like we don't want the Africans to meet the African American, right? Come on, we got to break that up. I already told them that the organization that's running Yali, I think we're going to have a protest today <laughs> over there. Somebody protesting them on K Street, you know, um, because of this. And so I want the next administration to fully engage African Americans also in the process. Not only African American, but other Americans of African descent. They're not even allowing them to meet the Nigerian American. You know, they, they, they kind of keep them like this here. And um, what I found about the government, uh, 
you know, you can actually help the government. You can get things done with the government. You can't push the government around. It don't help a whole lot by throwing eggs at them and yelling at them. That doesn't really work with the government. But if you can make them understand and get access to them and really give them a good idea to make them rationalize some things and let them know that you are going to protest them if they don't correct themselves. Uh, you know, you've got to have the, the, the stick behind. So I think, um, uh, I think the, the second one ought to be in the area of uh, uh, expanding on what Yali has accomplished, you know. And I think it involves uh, taking Americans, African Americans, over to Africa for a, a reverse fellowship, you know. Uh, what's wrong with that, you know. Um, and making sure that they meet each other. All you really got to do with young people is put them in the same room with some computers, you know. You know, just put them in the same room with the computer. Don't tell them nothing, you know, and uh, let them do their Googling and Facebooking and whatnot. They got it, you know, uh, they got it. And if you're putting powerful young people in the room, Jack, they're going to come up with business ideals. They're going to come up with technology. They're going to come up with innovation. They're going to come up with all kinds because all these young people are smarter than us. You guys don't like that, but they are. They're smarter than us. Um, and so uh, I think the two areas is this Centers for Disease Control, you know, we ought to, I would love to see my government say $10 billion, we're going to do this. You know, we're going to set it aside, but we've got to make sure the African governments are going to match it. You know, something like that, you know. And um, I want African scientists involved. I want uh, all these young people involved. And I want the solution come up. Let's call it reparations if you want. Call it reparations. Call it, you know, I mean, we owe, they owe us something. You know, the half has not been told. But I want to see my government, I want to see my government make a solid commitment to Africa that really don't sound like the benefit's going to be us. It is going to benefit us. You know, if, if, if we don't stop some of this stuff in Africa, trust me, it's going to be at our door. We learned that with Ebola. You know, you don't stop it in Africa, it could get on an airplane and be in your, your doorstep in, in a day. And so uh, I think help in Africa also is going to help us. It's global security is what we're talking about here. Get to the mic. And Just to share this piece of information, my name is Rachel Eden, and my older brother is in Atlanta, Georgia, and he deals with um, use medical equipment, so if it's of something of interest to you, I could connect you. I'm from Cameroon, by the way, so I could connect you with uh, him Okay. that school. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir? Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, I just wanted to add a few remarks on what Melvin and others have said. I am uh, Ambassador Salonte, Liberian Ambassador to the US. At some point in time during the Ebola fight, the Washington Post carried my picture as the Ebola ambassador in the US. Now, I didn't mind that. <laughs> but the, the question is, all of the international support that came on the margin of the Ebola, that money is there that should have been used to build the infrastructure in Africa. Like Melvin said, it's being directed to fight Zika. It's unfortunate that we have this kind of situation. How many of us are going to talk about that? But let me tell you the situation in Liberia. We were caught with our pants down, lack of infrastructure. But the last thing I wanted to comment on where Harriet talked about is this language, the resiliency from the people, we were using the imam, we were using the pastors, we were using community leaders to talk in their languages. And so that message resonated with the people. So the bottom line is uh, building proper health, not necessarily just building the structure, but creating the awareness, building that public health program throughout the communities can help to strengthen the and infrastructure. I can tell that we're going to accomplish our goals here today from just the beginning <laughs> of this discussion, but we're gonna move on to the next panel. Let's give our, our greeters, our first panel, a round of applause, thank you.